Last week, we heard about three visitors whom Abraham received under the oaks of Mamre. Today, those same three visitors continue on to their destination, and Abraham goes out with them to set them on their way. We already know from last week that these three visitors are somehow God. And as two of them go on to Sodom and Gomorrah, one stays behind and lets Abraham in on God's plan. Should I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? God asks himself. No, for I have chosen him to keep the way of the Lord by doing just righteousness and justice. The people of the region have raised a great outcry against the cities of the plain, and God is headed there to execute justice, the way that all of Israel's neighbors understood justice, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Evil behavior must have retribution, and evil people must be destroyed. However, God has also chosen to include Abraham in this conversation. And it is Abraham who offers us a different view of justice. Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked, he asks? Far be it from you to do such a thing. He then proceeds to haggle with God, wondering if 50 righteous in the cities is enough to save them, and then 45, and 40, and 30, and so on. I wonder if Abraham stops at 10, not because... He feels like he can't press his luck any further, or because 10 is the absolute minimum. But, I w but if maybe because he's made his point. He, he might have continued, what about five righteous people? What about one righteous person? What about one person who's righteous most of the time? <laughs> what about part of the time? What about one person who's righteous accidentally twice a year? But he doesn't have to. With his negotiation, he's already asked the important question, is there a lower limit to God's mercy? And the answer, it seems, is no. There is not. It is never just that the innocent should suffer with the guilty. As I read this story, it occurs to me that Abraham is successful in his bargaining, not because he's shrewd or eloquent or because God likes him better than anyone else, He's successful because he knows who God is. He knows the right questions to ask. He knows what God is already inclined to do. He knows, before he asks, that God would not punish the righteous with the wicked. We read this story to learn again what Abraham already knows, to learn who God is. This is a story that never happened. It's not a historical fact. This is a theological examination of a much older story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. These two cities were wiped out by something a very, very long time ago, and the common wisdom in the region was that they must have been destroyed by the judgment of the gods for their wickedness, because what else could cause such a thing? When Israel picked up this story and included it in their own history, that explanation didn't sit any easier with them than it does with us. And so, to complete the story, they added this narrative in which Abraham, the ancestor of Israel, questions the common wisdom about divine justice. The story concludes that God is not capricious or vengeful in God's justice, but is in fact merciful. That's a story that fits better with the God they already know. So here's a question for you then. How does Israel, or Abraham for that matter, know who God is? Remember that the first part of this story is about three visitors. At Mamre, they delivered to Abraham and Sarah a message of good news, a message of promise, that in due season the Lord would return and the couple, even in their old age, would bear a son. As I read that story, I wonder if maybe that's the moment at which the light clicked on for Abraham, and he recognized who these three men were. That whole story of Abraham throughout Genesis is one of God's continued faithfulness. God chooses Abraham 
seemingly at random, to be the father of many nations. And God continues to keep that promise through doubt and hardship, and even through Abraham's and Sarah's unfaithfulness to that covenant. To Abraham and to Israel, this kind of love and fidelity doesn't fit with the God who would wantonly destroy the innocent along with the guilty. They knew from generations of experience of their own story who God was and who God was not. We get a similar message about prayer in St. Luke's Gospel. When the disciples ask Jesus, teach us to pray, they may be asking, teach us how to make God listen to us or teach us to be pleasing to God so that God will favor us. But what Jesus offers instead is a reminder of who God is. He reminds them that prayer is not an attempt to persuade or manipulate God. It is instead asking God to be God. Hallowed be your name. Your will be done. Forgive us as you have taught us to forgive. Deliver us from evil as you already have. In teaching his disciples to pray, he's inviting them, perhaps, to get to know God better to return to their source, to come back and know who God is. And so who is this God to whom we pray? What has this God already promised us? How has this God already faithfully kept these promises? Whenever we pray, we do so in the context of this relationship that God has with us and with our parents and our grandparents all the way back to Abraham and Sarah. Whatever thanksgivings or praises or petitions we lift up, we lift them up to the one who has already written us into this story of faithfulness that stretches back to the very beginning, that traces its way through exile and return, through the mission to the Gentiles, the story that winds its way up the hill of Calvary and back down through the sealed tomb, continuing ever onward toward that promise of the healing of all creation. And so when we pray, we are finding our place in that story of faithfulness. Prayer not only reminds us who God is, it also then helps us figure out who we are. Our relationship with this faithful God informs our identities. When we voice our prayers, whether to ask for healing or guidance or to give thanks for good times or lament the hard times, we're voicing our deepest fears and desires. By naming those things, we allow them to become real. We admit to them. We reveal ourselves not only to God, but also to our own selves. Prayer is a way of exploring oneself as well. And just as with the haggling prayer of Abraham, we just might be changed by that experience. Abraham may have begun his negotiation with God in an attempt to save his nephew Lot, who lived in Sodom. But reading this story, I wonder if by the end, he'd started to feel that connection with all the people of the cities of the plain. Prayer is a journey of discovery, both of who God is and who we are. That foundation for Abraham's boldness before God and for the prayer that Jesus teaches us is the loving, intimate, faithful relationship that God already has with us. That relationship changes and evolves over time. All relationships do. We go through hard times and through good ones. And we may not ever really know what to expect from prayer, whether God can or will do what we ask. But in reading these stories, I begin to wonder if the answer to prayer is really the most important part. I wonder if there's something about prayer itself, whether or not we receive anything we might experience as a response that is just as important. According to Jesus' parable, the greatest gift 
we can hope to receive from God is the Holy Spirit. When I read that line, I think back to the story we read several weeks ago of Peter at Cornelius' house. Peter preached and he witnessed the Holy Spirit descending on Cornelius and his entire family, a bunch of Gentiles, even before they were baptized. And when he was later forced to defend himself, he recalled the story and he said, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. Think about the gift of that Holy Spirit that they received at Pentecost, what that meant to them. It wasn't just a gift that transformed Peter and his community into the church and gave them a mission to share the good news about Jesus. It was also a sign of God's love and acceptance of them for who they were. And now he sees that given to these Gentiles, people that just a day before he would have called unclean. And he sees what it means that God shows no partiality. Suddenly he's able to see himself in them and them in himself. If that's the spirit that we receive when we pray, then I have to wonder if prayer isn't meant to strengthen our connection with God and with our fellow people. In prayer, we carry one another's burdens. We rejoice with one another's celebrations. We mourn each other's losses. It's one of the most important reasons we share these prayer requests before the service so that we can experience these joys and sorrows together. Because of this gift of God, our prayers become something beyond mere spoken words or tangled thoughts. They become something that binds us together as community. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's not because of what we pray or who we are. In fact, it's not really about us at all. Instead, it's about who God is, right? Because God is fundamentally a God of relationship. A triune God in relationship even with God's own self. Through our prayers, God creates relationship and community among us as well. And so prayer, any prayer reminds us of this simple truth. Many, many years after Jesus' disciple asked him how to pray, Martin Luther's barber asked him the same question. And this part of Luther's response, I think, just neatly sums it all up, captures the essence of prayer. He writes, Finally, mark this that you must always speak the Amen firmly. Never doubt that God and God's mercy will surely hear you and say yes to your prayers. Never think that you are kneeling or standing alone. Rather think that the whole of Christendom, all devout Christians are standing there beside you and you are standing among them in a common united petition which God cannot disdain. Do not leave your prayer without having said or thought very well. God has heard my prayer. I know this as a certainty and a truth. This is what Amen means. Amen.